There you go. No Wait a minute. Face. You made a movie called. <laughs> you What's you it made called? a movie called The King. <coughs> yeah, that's what we're here for. I think. Oh, okay, because I, I, the last thing I recall was. Uh, it's one of the movies that I have out right now. I, can, we, I don't remember which one. <laughs> yeah, right. Last thing I remember was Why We Fight. Yeah, go fuck yourself. That was a long time ago. <laughs> that's a what is that? What have you done lately? <laughs> uh, I've seen them all. Oh, okay. Pretty sure I've seen them all. Actually, we met. Uh, we met um, uh, it was so many years ago now, but the Freakonomics, I, I think we talked around Freakonomics. Had, great. But I wasn't great, podcasting great. then, so I was working at POV probably. Okay. And I, I'm, I'm guessing. Wow. What you do on Wormwood? Not on Wormwood. in here, maybe. Oh, Errol Morris is an executive producer. <laughs> I was looking at his <laughs> bio. These are the outtakes. So yes, what did I do in Wormwood? <laughs> Wormwood. Like, what if I had answered thank that? Thank goodness. Research. I didn't really, I just, because I didn't, I mean, Errol Morris, he could take a hit or two. I mean, you know, he's one of the most brilliant filmmakers ever. And, like, you know, the, the I wound just Wormwood I didn't quite love. but then, The jousting that he and I do on the phone. Really? <laughs> oh, let's talk about that. That's That would be good. You know, I've been trying to get him on, too, for years. He's, like, one of the only guys that I haven't really, uh, from, like, the documentary sphere that I haven't talked to, which is, I brought, brought onto this podcast. I'd love to do that eventually. I'll go to Boston and do it. I'll go to Cambridge. I'm, I'm willing to do that. We'll work for food. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Me too. Oh, man. Yeah, it's pretty... Uh, <clears throat> a lot of pedigree here. Jesus Christ. Joe, Roseanne Cash. I, well, that's an interesting one. I guess that makes sense. It's that um, Nashville... Or it's the, just to demonstrate that you can even love this movie if you prefer Johnny Cash. It's Elvis, yeah. Which some people do. Yeah. But Johnny, he got a lot of his excesses out of the way early on. <laughs> so, and then kind of mellowed out over time, it, it seems. I'm friends with Rick Rubin. Oh, God. But I wasn't friends with him when they direct when he made those uh, recordings. Yeah, those Johnny. recordings. I worked at Sony Music then, and yeah. so I got to enjoy all that, that stuff. That well, no, I never met him. I just, I just got to, I just was enjoying all the output because we, we, rec- we uh, released, distributed all those when I was there, Columbia Legacy. We re- we distributed all that uh, Rick Rubin's American recording American stuff. Recordings. Yeah, I um, tried to get Rick. I encouraged Rick like crazy. Talking to the mic now because it's all um, this stuff is actually good too. I encouraged Rick Rubin to uh, do for Pete Seeger what he had done for Johnny Cash before Pete Seeger died because I felt that Pete Seeger was just as much a voice of the American people in the most important way, but that had also not been recorded in the way that Rick Rubin made absolutely historic recordings of Johnny Cash. Those recordings, because of the fidelity that Rick is able to bring to something as a producer, uh, you know, you you never heard Johnny Cash so good. Mm -hmm. And you're in the fiber of his voice. You can hear all the age and time and tide all of his the history of who he was and the hard thing about pete singer was we had gotten to a point where he really arguably couldn't sing um well you know he he was more of a well uh you know he he kind of yeah but it was was, just it was right before it was beyond his singing too it was like i know and i was like i don't care you know what he sounds like i mean johnny cash in those older recordings doesn't sound like the young johnny cash he sounds like he sounds like a of of you know a he sounds like he's moved somewhere between a man and a deity, and that voice is yeah. coming from that place. This would be my idea of the conversation, if you if you just allow me. You could say, you know, I'd love you. For, I think you should consider recording Pete Seeger. You know, uh, he's an icon, uh, one of the most important musical figures in our country, defines an entire genre of, of music. And Rick said, that's a great idea, but I'm recording with Neil Diamond. So excuse me. Like, That's pretty much the, the conversation <laughs> went, I guess. Yeah. Well, he I did, say, and he did a he did one album with uh, Neil he Diamond. Which he did. I think what I think what I the conversation but. really went like was me saying, Rick, I really think you should um, make some recordings of Pete Seeger, and Rick saying to me, um, "I'll get back to you on that." In the meantime, I've got 5,000 things I'm trying to do that are my own vision. But thank you very much for, <laughs> for your idea for of me. what my vision is. Um, yeah. Well, I it was a great he, idea, and it makes perfect sense. And, well, and I, I do want to memorialize our, our – we're living in a time where heroism has been cynically 
eviscerated for most people. I think it's hard for people. There's that beautiful Bruce Springsteen lyric of us waiting for a hero to rise from these streets. And I think that there's an idealist lurking somewhere deep inside, even the most cynical Americans. And they are always on the lookout for something that reminds us why it's good to be alive. And they're few and far between, these figures that rocket out of nowhere and suddenly define our lives and redefine our kind of hopes and dreams. And I think these recordings that memorialize some of those voices, they make them retain their currency so that I don't want to listen to a Pete Seeger record and hear the crackle of the 50s. I don't mind it. It's nice, that vinyl sound. But if I play it for my kid, they're going to be like, what kind of cobwebbed artifact are you playing me? Whereas if you listen to like Steely Dan recordings today from the early 1970s or Bob Marley recordings, they sound like they were recorded yesterday because the producing was so uh, advanced Mm -hmm. that it's standing the test of time. And I think uh, Rick Rubin has done that for Johnny Cash. And I would look around our midst right now at people like Belafonte and others and say, man, let's record them as they've never been recorded because they have a a story to tell now that also has the benefit of age. Right. And of course, the music industry, I mean, on on top of that, the music industry has always been about youth. Just because it has, it doesn't mean it has to be yeah. also. So I, I love the idea of... I like crow's feet on people. I like too. And the look voices, of people when they get on the crow's voices. feet in the voice. Yeah, you know? yeah. No, I agree with that. I think You can that, feel it. Sure. And, you know... It's what Elvis never got. No. And the closest he came and the closest he comes in my movie is Unchained Melody. Have you seen the movie? Yes, I have. I, I, I was joking before, but I understand why you asked that. Some, you may talk to occasionally people that haven't even seen your film, right? So, sometimes. E- even in even in full disclosure, I, look, I'm trying to get the message out about my movie. I can't expect everybody to have yeah. seen it before I said it or else I'd have nothing to advertise. I think it was a very ambitious idea. And it could have been one big, it could have failed so easily because it's so ambitious what you you were trying to do. There's a number of dimensions to the film and... There will be people who say I did fail. Well... There will be people who say that it's too ambitious or took on too much or... Well, it it does and there's a sprawl to it a bit, but in the end of the film, I I like, okay, yeah, I get get what, what Eugene's doing. I get what he's trying to do here and I really appreciate it. You ever look oh, at some uh, of the great big long novels, you know, Moby Dick or Oh sure. You know, Tom Sawyer, you know, different books in our literary history that move us. A lot of times when you go back and read them, they're much longer than you thought they were. And the reason that happens is that I think with certain very epic subjects, mm-hmm. um, to do them justice you have to take a bit of a journey. And this film's only an hour and forty five minutes long. It's just it's a big journey. Elvis's life was a big journey, the country's life Mm -hmm. And the country's journey has been long and varied. And to get all that together in a metaphoric, allegoric, poetical way, that was a filmmaking challenge. And I invite people to come on that trip with me. And I think for some people, they want to know, where am I going? Where am I going? Where am I going? It's a a common phenomenon in an age where Google can map you all the time. Mm -hmm. But there used to be a joy in not knowing where you're going. Mm -hmm. You know, that whole idea from Tolkien, not all who wander are lost. So there's some wandering that we do in the film, but we wander because Elvis was wandering. We wander because we took a Rolls Royce out across America to follow in his footsteps. And if I turn left or right, it's a different movie. There was no plan. Okay, so for those who don't know who are listening, the conceit uh, is that, let me take a baby step back. The movie, you you get Elvis's Rolls Royce, his car. I steal it in a bank in a bank robbery in a bank heist. And I I, I rob a car dealership. And um, that's not true. (laughs) And um, take it on a a road trip across the country, right? Yeah. And and who gets into the car is kind of part of the. You don't know. It could be uh, just uh, anyone. It could be musicians. It could be some well-known celebrity. It could be just anybody. I felt the American family was composed of all that. Everyday people, famous people, musicians, yeah. non-musicians, gas station attendants. Right. And and they explore America in the present day, but also what the idea of America is and where we're at with that idea, that concept of what what is America. And in a way, it makes sense to take this figure of Elvis because, you know, comes from just, just anywhere, I should say. Not Tupelo. No, 
Tupelo. Well, yeah, but I mean, he's but it's Tupelo, Tupelo is just a dot on yeah, the map. It's right. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's a little bit more of a known name now because well, Elvis came from there, right? And then I guess grew up in Memphis, or you know, yep. um, and was there was a, such a purity to to what he was doing. He just loved his mom and wanted to make her happy, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, and mm-hmm. and from there into gets kind of lost and the dream kind of gets diluted the dream kind of goes off the rails and it's a very american phenomenon because yeah. everything that that launched him into the stratosphere everything that made him singular and great from yeah. the start is ultimately what will unravel him and look at look at us look at everything i'm standing in this room with you looking out at the empire state building and all these towering skyscrapers and they all rose up out of Land that we stole from people, Mm -hmm. land that was blood-soaked, land that watched us enslave African-Americans and so many kind of crimes of history while also building the most majestic, the most extraordinary human achievements imaginable. It means so so much to everyone around the world, too. People come here, they feel like they've really arrived. So to this day, it's why there's so many people coming and it's why we're watching the government do horrendous things to them. Um... All that just in that in that metaphor itself, we just watched the president try to construct juvenile concentration camps at the border. That's America. But they're coming here because the other America, the kinder, more beautiful shining city on a hill is somehow also here. Mm -hmm. So when we went out across the country in Elvis's roles, we didn't take a Cadillac or a Thunderbird, a Bruce Springsteen mobile. We didn't take like a blue collar American dream mobile. We right. took the car that a king buys, and in this case, a very lost king, a bloated king, a drug, a drugged out king, a king who's who's broken his heart, and that was intentional. It was why we chose the car we chose instead of those other cars, and what it produced when you drive through the American heartland, from the forsaken inner cities to the sort of scarred landscape of uh, foreclosed farms in this country and farm communities is that the people are still here. They still have the same soul that once overwhelmingly made America great, but they're caught up in mythologies about how to make it great again. They've been sold a bill of goods that hatred is any part of the soul of America, that that love thy neighbor was not how we got here. Love thy neighbor is how we got here. Collective action is how America happened. And the bad part, the slavery, the genocide, all that stuff, that was always there. But that was always there throughout history in all countries. So America didn't invent that stuff. We just were doing it while we were also doing something new and different. And it was what was new and different that made us great. Now, that's catapulted us into a level of power, and power corrupts. And it happened to Elvis. The power and money eroded him. Who was it in the documentary, again, it's called The King, who said at every step of the way Elvis went with the money. So he was offered this deal, and instead of doing the... You know, he was offered a deal at RCA. He leaves Sun Records. He goes to RCA. He takes the good for the money. Then he takes instead of what other trade takes the big. Or he goes to Vegas ultimately yeah. instead of goes to Hollywood. He takes the he biggest takes money the, in right, Hollywood. Takes the big rather contract, than quality projects. Right. He realizes if the yeah. films. Are, what about you know? What it was Ethan Hawke? Ethan, Ethan Hawke makes a really beautiful speech in the movie yeah. about that lost authenticity of Elvis and how it was compromised by the big business that the Colonel brought into Elvis's life. Mm. And big business is a huge theme in this movie. We, we live in a country that's run by the point oh 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 one percent to the detriment of everybody else, and it's ruined American democracy. The same thing happened to Elvis, but it ruined his authenticity as an artist. The money and the power became primary, and everything else fell second. And when that happens, I don't want to see any of those movies. You? All you want to see is the real Elvis who made you yeah. feel like you were happy to be alive. You don't want to see him in reruns in B movie cheesy knockoffs, right. which is just about the money. Right. It's, it's, it's every step of the way. It's uh, as you describe it. It's interesting because we, all those Elvis movies from the fifties and sixties that you know they're they populate the, the the TV channels. But what we talk about when we mm-hmm. talk about the myth, we mythologize it, right? So we talk about the comeback. Right. We put that up as this sure. represents, and and and, and to a, to an extent, the comeback which happened in 1968, Elvis takes the world by storm in the 50s. Then he joins the military, and as John Lennon pointed out, 
when he went to the military, they gave him a crew cut. They cut off his sideburns. But John Lennon suspects they cut off something else as well because he came back. I don't know what you're referring to. He came back an emasculated (laughs) man who no longer was a radical, sexual, racial, social threat to America, which is what he was. He comes back this Jerry Schilling, Elvis's best friend, points out in the film that he went away James Dean, a real rebel, and he came back John Wayne, the face of the American imperial capitalistic system, the cowboy America that's that's not really the coming up from nowhere America. It's mm-hmm. the I'm the new sheriff in town America. Mm-hmm. And that Elvis who comes back is the Elvis we then watch unravel over the remaining years of his life. And there's one exception which is this one night in 1968 where Elvis finally gets to do what Elvis passionately wants to do, which is to effectively go back in time. He comes on national television dressed in black leather. Head to toe. He looks like a golden god. Everybody in the world falls in love with him all over again, and they're like, that's the Elvis I once knew and loved. Where has he been all these years? He's back. And he blows us all away. And then the very next day... He's right back on the trail to Vegas, right back on the follow the money, right back toward that white sequin jumpsuit. And that I always found it ironic. You know, there's a big story in the film and in Elvis's life about Elvis and the black community, because there's no question that as a young person, people will say Elvis stole black music when he arrived on the scene. Chuck D is in the film and Chuck D most famously in Fight the Power accuses Elvis of being a racist. But he's extremely uh, brilliant guy, and he points out in the film in a very surgical way what he meant by calling him a racist. And what he says is, I never meant by calling him a racist that that was because he played black music, which people would say he stole black music. Chuck D believes culture is culture and says it very clearly in the film that you wouldn't tell a young African-American kid not to play Mozart because he's not German. And likewise, you shouldn't tell Elvis not to play black music. That's wonderful that he does it. And at the time in history, the 1950s, when Elvis played black music, you could get hung for playing black music. So it was very courageous. So when you see Elvis at that young age and he's fueled by the black community and he's imbued with power from the black community, you see the 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 hurricane that it unleashes across America and the world. But many years later, Chuck D and Van Jones and others in the film question, well, well, where was Elvis when the black community that benefited him now needed him in the civil rights movement? Why was he so eerily quiet at that time? Well, in 1968, he gives us a signal that I think Elvis understood this on some primal level, because when he goes into that comeback special and he wants to have another strike, another chance in the in the sunlight, what does he do? He dresses in black leather. There's no white sequins. He's gone away from whiteness, and he's going back to black. And I think that symbolism of Elvis in that one night of back to black is a tragic reminder that he understood what was happening. He understood that his power had come from blackness and that as all the power got almost sort of sucked out of him, Mm -hmm. like some IV drip taking away his, you know, in the cartoon when you can watch the blood level of somebody go down and they become totally white— Elvis lost that soulful blood that was in him, and he becomes this white, kind of beached whale of a man. Well, he has this one night, and he goes back to black, but it only lasts one night. Don't know why. I mean, I do know why, but I don't know why. What counts for all the people that go go to Vegas? What does he represent to all those crowds in in Vegas, night after night, to all those sold-out crowds? The most hilarious thing about Las Vegas today, if you go around Vegas, his face is on every wedding chapel. And this guy didn't have like a reliable, steady married life. He's like a symbol of failed marrying. So it's particularly bizarre because to get married in an Elvis wedding chapel, and no offense to any of your listeners who got married there, and best of luck to your your union, but my guess is you're getting married at a place that kind of says marriages don't really tend to last very long. At least if Elvis is your model. Oh, you think most people think it through that far? I, think I don't doing, think so. They, most people think, that do it, don't you think they're doing it ironically? Like they're going to the chapel because they are. it's a thing to do for like shits and giggles. Yes, 100%. Yeah. But there's something still ironic about every move we make. Yeah, no, for sure. Right? The, why that, is uh, it right, happening The unconscious part of it, the, the, the bigger picture yeah. of why we... There's a deeper we, irony. There's a deeper irony, yeah. Because there's a deeper irony that Americans, broadly... Mm-hmm. We have come to lionize and elevate, in my view, things that are not admirable. 
And I think we've put power and money ahead of everything else. And it blinds us. Mike Myers is in the film and he says, what kind of a democracy is this, America, that broke off from England to get away from having a king? And now we're obsessed with kings. Every time we turn around, we got Burger King, Muffler King, King of Beers, King Size Bed, Elvis, the King of Rock and Roll, Michael Jackson, the King of Pop. Everything's King, Queen, this, that. What royal obsession do we have? Look at how many Americans just watched the royal wedding. This is a wedding in the country we broke off from to expressly be the opposite of that country. Do we have Stockholm Syndrome? Were we living under kings and queens so long that we're just used to it? So it's like, yeah, we kind of have a democracy. Anyway, show me the royal wedding. I'm really curious what she's going to wear today. And will the queen like her or not like her? That madness is a contradiction that is similar to getting married in an Elvis wedding chapel and not asking yourself, what does that symbol really mean? Because nobody goes into that chapel thinking, I hope that my fiancé and I will end up having a life that's very short-lived, and I'll be kept at the margin of his life, and he'll have thousands of other women that he's with, and he'll sing and make popular songs for the world, and I'll sit at home kind of marginalized, you know, drowning in my own tears. I mean, I don't think anyone thinks that's what they're wanting to head for. Then what are you getting married in an Elvis wedding chapel for? Mm -hmm. I understand the short, ironic joke of it, Mm -hmm. but there's something of a dark Faustian deal with the devil that you're doing there. And we do it all the time. And it's almost symbolic, in my view, of the way in which Americans flirt with that which we know is damaging to us. I think we've done it with the current president. I think Americans felt abused for decades by the system where the point oh 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 one percent have everything and the rest of us are scrambling like, sure. uh, like ro- roaches. Mm-hmm. And desperate from all that abuse, the American people said, I feel so abused. The next person who walks through that door, the next fool who walks through that door, saying anything at all against this system, I'll go with that guy. So what did we end up with? We ended up with the rebound guy. That's all we have. This is just an abusive rebound guy. And we all know that until you look inward at your messed up priorities, you'll always end up with a new version of the guy you were already with. This is a standard fact of human dynamics. When did you begin the film? <laughs> That's a hilarious <laughs> transition. Sorry. Clumsy, it's like saying, when, clumsy, did, you, when, when did you begin the... When did uh, when you did get this, on this rant? Let's, no, um, no, 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 whatever. <laughs> before you lost your mind... The, the name of the podcast is Clumsy Transitions. Yeah. I'm the host. The, the, Why did you make this film? Why well, on I earth kept, would you make this film? I kept film? interrupting previous couple of guests because like, I had Wendell Pierce on, who, who's from New Orleans, and I had on... Um, Why you marry him? Andrew Fleming. Yeah, I'm sure he was great. Uh, no, no, and I bring this up because I kept bringing up, like, we'll be talking, have a nice conversation about their films, and then I'll bring up Andrew Bourdain, and, it, and then try to kind of... Anthony Bourdain. Anthony, excuse Please, me, Anthony... call him by the right name. I was thinking of your brother. Yes. I was thinking Anthony Bourdain. I love Anthony Bourdain. Well, everybody seemed to love him for one reason, but I only brought him up because I try to kind of f- make sense out of it, and then go back from that to any kind of conversation it's yeah. just it's just going to be clumsy you know i understand but uh, at this point we can try to break it up i a don't mind bit your smoothly. transition you can say when did i start the film <laughs> well five i'm gonna years let me ago. five years ago so yeah, slightly before ago. the last presidential election yes cycle, we started filming but shortly does... before the election started and okay. we were filming throughout 2016 so the country was was literally being torn right from left while we were driving across the American landscape and we were timing. watching the country be riven asunder while we were trying to learn what is the state of the American dream. Couldn't have been more fortuitous. Well, again, the name of the film is The King and it's it's opening on the uh, tomorrow, Friday, right? The, uh, the 22nd? Is that correct? I believe so. You're here. So where, where, are, where do you live, by the way? I live here. You you are here. Yep. And it premiered at the at Cannes. It premiered first at Cannes and then at the Sundance Film Festival. Right. Uh, those are those are, yeah, they're they're pretty good festivals. I understand. I guess if you like that, if you like a festival, if you're interested in festivals, but um, and I'm just find the the list of, of folks that you corralled that you cast in here. You have a, uh, I'm not going to go through all of them, but you mentioned a couple. You mentioned uh, Chuck D. Chuck D, Chuck, Alec Baldwin, Alec, Ethan Hawke, Emmy Lou Ethan Harris, Hawk we talked about. Roseanne Cash, Mike right. Myers, the Peter great and Gronick, powerful Van Jones. Right. So Peter for those Gronick. Peter who, you know, did a double uh two two volume biography of Elvis. Yes. But this is kind of into terrain in a way. 
you're kind of talking about Elvis, and then again, you're really not talking about Elvis. I think that's the point of the film, because we're right. really talking about America. You could also be talking about the day the music died and all these other yes. kinds of, you know, where people try to exp use music or musicians. I don't know. I, I, this is a lofty question. I guess, what is it about singers or musicians in, in, in particular? Do you, do you know like that? Well, it's, that part of this, it's part of this King thing I was talking about. You, think you so? know, America, on the one hand, we think that it's all made and, or broken by the of the people, by the people, for the people thing. Yeah. We love people. We believe in people. We think that people all together, banded together, doing that barn raising, make the world that we live in. Mm -hmm. And then strangely, we have a bizarre and excessive elevation of certain people as if they're more special than you and me and we put them up on pedestals mm -hmm. by the way we ultimately destroy them and why we do that is fascinating and i think it's almost healthy that we do that in one way and of course profoundly unhealthy in another way because what it says is that there are certain people among us that are special people which means the rest of us are the ordinary people. Mm -hmm. I'm always having to write write-ups about my film, about how it has famous people and not so famous people in it, or totally unknown people, and I never know how to word it. Famous people and ordinary people. Mm. Famous Americans and ordinary Americans. Mm -hmm. well, I don't know that anybody's ordinary. I'm not necessarily more ordinary than Michael Jackson. Maybe he was very ordinary, but the mm -hmm. world exploded from him. Does that make him less ordinary than you? I, it, it's just we we've made a false in my view yes i recognize there are special talents mm -hmm. unbelievable abilities tiger woods on the golf course we could go on and on is a bruce sure. springsteen on a stage i mean it goes but we would be wrong to misunderstand what got that person there is that they are standing on the shoulders of the giantude of human history that Bruce Springsteen is an oracle filled with the voices of mm -hmm. thousands and millions of other oracles. And so what's wailing out of him is a combined chorus of those angels, demons, and, 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 and bureaucrats, and workers, and cab drivers, and plumbers, and farmers, right? It's all taken together, and we make the mistake, I think, of over-investing in these luminary people. And yet at the same time, Maybe they're just cornerstones to remind us about something of ourselves. So, in other words, in a sense, even though it, you kind of answered an earlier question, which I asked before, which is what explains all the sold-out crowds in Vegas? What was the draw, you know? If he isn't the Elvis of the 68 comeback, if he's not the Elvis of those early Sun records, what's, what's the appeal of, of watching this guy self-destruct? But then... I do believe he does kind of represent all those angels and devils you describe. It's something that attracted everybody to him. You're probably onto something there because I think I think that there is also a moth to a flame quality about all of us. Like we we all have a macabre interest in hearing the crash at the end of a screech on the road outside. Sure. And are we thinking, I hope nobody's been hurt. I should stop whatever I'm doing and run out and be helpful to the wounded and this and that. Well, there's a part of us that'll kick in like that. But I think if we're honest with ourselves, almost like an animal in, in, in the savannah or in, in the Sahara, we're sitting there and we're thinking to ourselves, hey, there's a sound of danger. There's a sound and our pulse quickens like a creature. And I think there's a part of us that has this moth to flame relationship with danger. How many of us do things? that are self-destructive to ourselves. And in a minute way, if we drink too much or we take drugs too much or we gamble too much or we any of the vices that ensnare people, we understand those as frailties in the human condition. We understand that whatever we're doing there is probably filling some hole we have in ourselves, some self-soothing that we're trying to do and we may not even realize it. But what I think that stands for, and it links America and Elvis in such a profound way, is that I think Elvis is parallel to America. It's constant. He rises as we rise. He plateaus as we plateau. He achieves incredible power and is unprepared for it, just like we do. And before he starts a real just sort of uh, 
precipitous descent into the demise that will ultimately take his life. Along the way, he starts to self-soothe and self-medicate, reaching out for all manner of quick fix, narcotics, uh, carbohydrates, uh, um, consumption, vanity, sex, violence. He's shooting guns all over the place. We do all those things. And there's something about the American propensity for addiction and Elvis's propensity for addiction that speaks to a fracture in the soul and it cries out for therapy. If what we wanted for Elvis, and I don't mean therapy like we all got to go to a therapist. I mean, Elvis should have probably gone to a therapist and gotten some help with his demons. We as a society, we know what the therapy is. This is a society that has put power and money on a pedestal above all else, and it is destroying our democracy. It is destroying the trust we can have that this society is run for us, by us. It is instead run by a point oh 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 one percent for them at our expense. That's the na- name of the game. Until we get our head around that and stop buying a bunch of baloney about trickle down this or trickle down that, that has never occurred and everybody knows it, we're going to keep fooling ourselves. And honestly, we're headed to a precipitous place for the whole planet. Because one of the ways we've ignored the writing on the wall, one of the Kool-Aids we've drunk is about the environment. And it's coming, it's coming home to roost now. So are we going to get this memo? and actually save the world? It's like a Rocky movie. Are we going to come back and, mm-hmm. and run up those steps of the Philadelphia Museum or not? And that question is upon us right now, and I made the king to try to remind people what it looks like. Elvis, dead on the toilet at 42, when our hero doesn't get the memo. And we are our hero, and we're either going to get the memo or we're not. There's no one else. Again, Eugene Jarecki is the director of The King. It opens uh, Friday, June 22nd here in New York. And I'm going to guess in Los Angeles. The film yeah. opens tomorrow in New York, June 22nd. Right. Please, 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 everybody come. Bring You'll thousands be, of friends. I will be there. Uh, people on the crew and the cast will be there. It's very important that people come out to support a film like this on sure. the opening weekend. Because that's where the rest of the country gets the memo. This is a good right. film. This is a bad film. Sure. This is an important film or not. Right. And then we open in L.A. next Friday, June 29th. Okay, the 29th. Very good. Okay. Oscilloscope is distributing the film. In fact, what I'll do is I'll post this conversation right away. Fantastic. Um, so we make the weekend. and Really cool. Even though the podcast goes up on th- usually t- Thursdays. But we can... Fudge it. Just so you, have, you know when to look for new episodes. <laughs> it's nice to finally sit with you. I've been watching your films for a long time. Thank, Thank you so you much. For- yeah. Great to be here. Really <laughs> cool. It was fun. Okay, good.